the disciples waited. Jesus said, go. But then he turned around and said, wait. And then sometimes that's hard for us to do, ain't it? It's, it's the waiting. Um, and, and even though we're told to go, um, God, Jesus told them to wait on the Holy Spirit, right? It was the Holy Spirit was going to be the one who would come and to empower them. They would be filled with his spirit. So Jesus is saying, I don't want you to go on your own accord. I, not, I don't want you to go under your own power. I am sending you out under the power of my spirit. He will fill you. He will in, dwell in you. That's tabernacle. Remember, all through scripture, we've seen these uh, um, illustrated in other things when they built the tabernacle, for instance. And so the tabernacle means to dwell. And now... God's Spirit dwells within every believer, and that's important. Every believer, not every person, but every believer. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Many who, uh, because of the uh, disciples waiting and being obedient, listened, confessed their sins, and were baptized uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They were united or they were uh, uh, made a part of um, the body of Christ. Uh, the church is being birthed, is being born. And we are all, like we said, called, uh, if you are a child of His, if you accept Christ, we are called to proclaim the gospel wherever we go, as we walk, as we live our, our life. Our life should be, and with words sometimes too, uh, we need to uh, proclaim uh, the gospel. So Jesus said all authority had been given uh, to him, and now he has, when he, he, when he rose, uh, Peter tells us that, when, um, that he rose as Savior and Lord. Uh, that he's not, um, he's not just the humble servant anymore, but he is being given all authority, and he is now Savior and Lord. And so before returning, of course, uh, back to his rightful place in heaven, he gave his disciples these, a, a final command. So at this point, the disciples had to trust, and they had to wait uh, for the Holy Spirit. When Jesus went, arose or was ascended back uh, into heaven, um, they had to wait on the Holy Spirit. They had to wait for His power uh, to fill them and to give them the boldness that they were going to need uh, to carry out this uh, mission. And we need that same Holy Spirit today. So we will see now from this point going forward, uh, from Acts going forward, we will uh, notice and we will see the work of the person of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who is moving uh, these men. It's the Holy Spirit who adds to the church. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit who, convict, who convicts uh, people of their sinfulness. It's, that, it's the Holy Spirit's job to do all of those things. We have never been asked uh, to save anybody, just proclaim, proclaim. Unfortunately, sometimes when we proclaim, not all are going to understand uh, that message. Uh, but we are still called, nonetheless, to proclaim, right? And to pray, as these disciples were doing in the upper room that day. So in Acts chapter 2, uh, we're going to begin uh, with verses 1 through 4. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. 
and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. When the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, if I was to ask you, uh, when you think of the word Pentecost, what's the first thing you think of? The church? Pentecostal church? Speaking in tongues, maybe? Did you know that the Pentecost was actually a feast? The Pentecost was actually a feast. It was called the Feast of Weeks. It was also referred to as the Feast of Harvest. And the word Pentecost means 50th. That's what the word Pentecost means. So what the day of Pentecost was, if you go back into Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15 through 17, it describes for us what the day of Pentecost was actually all about. It says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. Now this is the, the Sabbath day after the week of the Passover. So right at the end of the Passover, starting with that first uh, day, which would be on our day, Sunday. So after Saturday was their Sabbath at this time. So on that Sunday, you were to count from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two tenths of an ephah, and they shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. That's important. And they are the first fruits of the Lord's. Now during the Passover, you know, the bread was made with unleavened. It was unleavened bread. But during this feast, which was 50 days after the Passover, the day of Pentecost, this was to be brought before the Lord and it was to be made with leaven. It was the day of harvest. It was, it was to a reminder or a celebration of the daily provisions that the Lord gave them. And, it, and, it, it's, and we should be thankful for that too, right? I mean, we should be thankful for the daily provisions that God gave them. So what is the day of Pentecost? has to do with the giving of the Holy Spirit. Well, you see, the Holy Spirit was sent on the day of Pentecost because it represents the first fruits after the resurrec resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was the first fruit after His resurrection was, that was the promise was going to be given to us after Jesus ascended back into heaven. That's what Jesus told His disciples. His disciple says the promise will come. I'm going to pray to the Father that the promise of the Holy Spirit will come after I ascend. It's to your advantage, he says, that I ascend. So the Holy Spirit, the giving of the Spirit, was the first fruit of His resurrection given to all Christians. This is something different. It had never happened before. The Holy Spirit did not dwell within man until this day. Until this time, he would be dwelling with us forever. He will never leave us nor forsake us all the days of our life. And how he was going to do that was through his indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So those that would be saved during the day of Pentecost, we, would, we could say that during this day of Pentecost, that those 3,000 that was first added to the church were the first fruits of the giving of the Holy Spirit. It was the result of the giving of the Holy Spirit. It won't necessarily the message that the disciples preached to the people. It was the Holy Spirit, it says, that gave them utterance. They won't speak in foreign languages. They won't speak in things that nobody understood. They were speaking what the Holy Spirit gave them utterance to say. Acts, you know, it says, what was these uh, disciples doing 
before, right before the Holy Spirit came. In Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, it says, Then uh, they returned, and this is the, the eleven, the disciples, uh, and some of the women were with them, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were stand. Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These are all continued, it said, with one accord. One accord in prayer and in supplication. That means not only were they, they were praying to the Father, but they were praying on behalf of others too. That's what supplication prayer is. It's praying on the behalf of something else, somebody else, right? So they were continued, it said, in one accord, in one place, praying in supplication as with and as, uh, along with the women, Mary, and the Mary, mother of Jesus, was also there. And his brothers, Jesus' brothers, were there. And if you notice anything in the Gospels, there were some accounts where at one time the brothers were not believers, even though they grew up with Jesus. They weren't true followers at that time, but it says here, and I thought that was pretty uh, 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 nice to note here, that even his brothers was in this room and they were all praying. And so in Acts uh, 2, where in our scriptures we just read in verse 2, it says that the, while the disciples uh, were still in this upper room and while they were praying in one accord, at, you know, everybody was in unison and what they knew exactly what they were praying about, that a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind came in and filled, it said, the whole house and each disciple, and that's what was an a, a illustration. It won't literally tongues of fire. It won't like little tongues flying around in the air landing on them. It's just an illustration. Um, that the Holy Spirit was empowering. That's what that word, that's what that's a symbol of in verses three, that these uh, this fire uh, of from the Holy Spirit symbolically filled each one of these disciples and gave them power and gave them utterance. So it was the Holy Spirit who gave them the ability to speak and those around them heard, it says, in their own language. So and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. The Spirit, though, is what's important here to realize it was the Holy Spirit that was speaking through them that gave them that power to speak. And it's the same Holy Spirit that we have today. Now why, uh, the, it, and, this is, not, and this, is, this is a rhetorical question now. <laughs> why do we uh, not see the Holy Spirit uh, using us like that today? Well, that's his choice, right? God gives us all uh, abilities. He gives us talents to use. And at certain times, He gives special power, special power to be able to heal, to be able to raise people from the dead, to be able to speak. And at the same time, those that are sitting right here speaking multiple different languages, understand me, and I ain't got to speak in all of your tongue, but it's the Holy Spirit that is interpreting to you that speaks this other language to understand me. That's the power of God. The Holy Spirit, the disciples didn't have that ability. But it's the Holy Spirit who has that ability. And he gives power to those when he went at certain power to those when it's needed. We don't all have the same um, talents, but we're all called to proclaim the gospel. 
and to use whatever God gives us, whatever that power, that time that we're needed, whatever words that are needed, he's going to let that happen. And I know for a fact uh, he does that because he's done that through me many times and he does it all the time while I'm teaching, whether you know it or not. <laughs> Sometimes I say things, I was like, I don't have that written down. <laughs> Where did that come from? It's the, honestly, it's the Holy Spirit. And, and I believe that if we are honest, if we are truthful, and we are committed and we are to the Holy Spirit and allow him to move us and speak through us, he will help us when at that moment that you need it. That's right. And that's what these guys did. You have to be open. You have to be just surrender your own will, and that is uh, truthful. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. So yeah, so uh, what Bill said was God was not a God of, of confusion. And so, and if, uh, if that won't true, then all these men that were around them that day would not have understood anything uh, that they were said unless somebody in that spoke their language told them, right? Just like at the Tower of Babel. God confused the languages there. He did not allow them to understand each other at that moment. See, that's the power of God. And so we have to understand when we, are, when we work uh, for God, when we do the work of God, when we do it right, uh, we are doing it on the power of the Holy Spirit, and it is always the Spirit that moves and teaches and makes people understand and convicts them of their sins. It's the, that's what the Holy Spirit does. That is not my, our power. We, we don't have that power. So the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Jesus uh, told the disciples a little bit um, in John 14, verses 15 through 17, exactly what the Holy Spirit would do for them. He says, if you love me, in, in John 14, 15 through 17, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. See that? The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit of truth. It's not given to the world. That's what, John, that's what Jesus said. Not what William is saying. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. He said, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you. For he dwells with you. How does he dwell? Because Jesus was standing in front of him. He's dwelling with you now and my spirit will dwell with you when I leave. And it's not for all, but it is for those, the redeemed. Jesus said the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. You know what that means? The Holy Spirit will never contradict the Word of God. The Holy Spirit never contradicts the Word of God. If anybody, so that means, if anybody says anything, whether in this church, outside this church, or any other church, if it is not in the Scripture, it is not of the Holy Spirit. If, it, if you can't find it in Scripture, it's not true. Don't believe it. There is no new prophecies. Jesus was the final Word of God. He was the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit dwells within us. He gives us the power to understand, to discern. And we do that through His word and that is what helps us to be able to in the other um, 
uh, the books uh, written like Paul's writings uh, and Peter's writings. They tell us all the time, rely on the Holy Spirit. We have to be able to identify false doctrines. We have to be able to identify false teachings, especially now in the time that we live in now. Uh, it's very critical that we understand whether what we're hearing, what we're learning, what we hear on our radios or on our TVs, if you listen to any of those, whatever is being said to us is of God. Is it of Scripture? If it's not, don't listen to it. Jesus also said that the world is unable to receive the Holy Spirit because they do not see Him nor know Him. See, by... I mean, just uh, by uh, nature, the world is not seeking a God who loves them. We didn't, we didn't, we weren't born and grow up uh, and taught in school to go seek God and go to seek God's will. We're not taught that. Matter of fact, it's really drilled in now. It's to seek your own pleasures, do what you love to do, do only, you know, seek only those things. Um, that you find satisfaction in. That's what the world says. See, that's, that's of the devil. God wants us to, uh, uh, to be successful. He wants us to, uh, to make it in this world. He, want, he wants you to, if it's a, uh, a particular job that God is calling you to do, like nursing or doctor or a lawyer or whatever, uh, you, uh, that God has called you to do, He wants you to be successful in those positions because He wants godly people in those positions. He wants godly people in our offices, in our local government, in our, 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 our state governments, in our federal governments. He wants Christians in all of those places so that we can make a difference in a world who needs Him. He wants that. But it's only going to be done through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 14, 18, that I will not leave you as orphans. See, he told his disciples, I'm not, going to, I'm not leaving you, in other words, for you to be out on your own. Jesus says, I'm not returning to heaven to abandon you. That's what he means by that. I'm not leaving you orphans. Orphans are abandoned. Right? They were abandoned. So Jesus says, I'm not abandoning you. That's what he means by that. I'm not abandoning you when I go back to heaven. No, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. I'm going to send my Spirit upon you, and I'm going to dwell with you. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. Jesus said, He and the Father are one. And now we see and learn that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. It's His Spirit that lives in us. I like the statement in our book. If you I read, uh, I think it was in the first, toward the end down now, uh, of, of our lesson, it makes this statement about the Trinity, and I thought it was pretty cool. He says, The Trinity is not a riddle to be solved, but a wonder to be behold by faith. See, we. We ha I, I, I remember a lady one time, um, I was speaking at the courtyard one time. And it was a lady that lived there. She didn't come in to our Bible studies um, when we had them. Um, she didn't come inside at the time because uh, she was a, a Jehovah Witness. And she met me outside the door uh, after I was teaching. She was standing outside the doors where we were teaching, and when I walked out, she spoke to me. And this was one of the things that she had issues with. She says, there ain't but one God, and y'all believe in more than one God. I said, no, I don't. If you are referring to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are one God. There's one God. It's hard to explain to somebody, ain't it? Try to explain that. 
You know, I mean, it is. And I, I, it's no uh, way around it. But it's not really uh, until the Holy Spirit can help them understand uh, what that really means. It's, on, in, in my words, I could never come up with words good enough to say that they are one, even though uh, they are three persons that are full of truth, full of love, who love each other unconditionally. Those three I'm talking about. Love each other unconditionally. Make up a triune God. One God. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the hang-ups, though. That's just one. And it might not necessarily be a Jehovah Witness. It could be somebody else that doesn't uh, don't affiliate themselves with any uh, religion could be uh, confused about that. And that's understandable, and I do understand that. Don't get me wrong. I understand that. But they are one. The Holy Spirit was for all believers, not all the world but for all believers. The Holy Spirit would be how God will also advance His kingdom. And we see that. We are a result of the Holy Spirit, even today. But we are a result of the Holy Spirit moving that day through all them disciples, through all those 3,000 and the other, however many they were that won't name, uh, numbered uh, in adding to the church, that they went back to their homes and they spread it, the gospel, and it just went like wildfire from there, right? I mean, it just spread from there. It's amazing. The Holy Spirit uh, would be how God moves and advances His kingdom. Joel 28 said God would one day pour out His Spirit on all humanity in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. That's what Joel said. He will pour out His Spirit on all humanity. God advances His kingdom through His church by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we work today. Number two, the Holy Spirit comes to empower the, and spread the gospel. Acts uh, 2 verses 22 through 24. First, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. And I'm going to skip down to 36 through 40 real quick. I'm going to go ahead and read those. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth, the one that they had crucified, whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. So now he is Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, it said that they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit was for the redeemed, those who ask forgiveness of their sins. That's what the gift of the Holy Spirit is for. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will call. And with many other words... He testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse 
uh, generation. That's what Peter um, it said, testified with many other words, be saved and be saved from this perverse generations. Verses 5 through 13, uh, we didn't read, uh, but I'm, I'm not going to read every verse. I'm just in a nutshell. says that Jerusalem was filled that day with Jewish devout men. That's what it says. You go back and read. It says they, it was filled with Jewish devout men during the day of Pentecost, that feast, that celebration, from all nations to celebrate that day of uh, Pentecost. It says these men heard that, uh, that sound or, or that mighty Russian wind. They heard something uh, come through Jerusalem that day uh, that went into that upper room and filled those men. And it said they went to investigate these men. They all uh, started investigating what they heard. Where was it at? What, where did it go? You know, so they are looking around. And, so they, and they found these disciples. And it says at this time, of course, they had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the disciples began to preach. If you go back, that's when it says that they understood them. They began to preach to them but the, uh, uh, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And each one of these, it said, understood in their own language, in their own native language that they spoke. They understood what these men were saying. Now, they thought these men were drunk. They thought the disciples were drunk. These men did. And because that's what they say, hey, these, these men have been drinking, and Peter said, no, they're not. Now, whether they drank or not, I don't know, but Peter said, no, they're not. It's only 3 o'clock. It ain't 5. No, just... <laughs> It's only 3 o'clock. They ain't been drinking. He said, they have been filled with the Holy Spirit. These men have been filled just like, and he, and he went back, uh, just like we read a while ago, a part of Joel chapter 2. He, they, he went back and read them those uh, scriptures in Joel. He told them that they were filled uh, with the Holy Spirit, just like the prophet Joel said that one day God was going to pour out His Spirit on all humanity. And this is a result of that. It, he, in other words, He's saying this is being fulfilled in your sight right now. Right? So Acts uh, 2, 17, uh, was, that was in Acts 2, uh, 17 through 21, if you want to go back uh, and read that later. That, those words, those verses came from the prophet Joel. So Peter began to explain that, that this Jesus of Nazareth that performed these miracles, that performed all these wonders that you saw, performed all the signs that, that you saw, healed sick, raised the dead in your midst, that He is a sign, that Jesus is a sign and a confirmation from God that Jesus was the promised Messiah. That's what Peter started preaching to these that day at the Pentecost. Jesus' is confirmation that he was the Messiah, but based on what he did, based on what God did through Jesus. And then Peter went on and told them, but because of you, and not just you, but all of us, because of the lawless hands, he was taken and he was crucified, and he was put to death, but God raised him from the dead. And Peter said that even King David prophesied about Jesus and how God would not allow him to remain in the grave. David made a comment. He said that the Lord said to my Lord. And if you go back and you read that verse... He says that the Lord is in all caps said to my Lord, capital L, which is Jesus, said to my Lord. See, David understood this, what the disciples are preaching about now to these men. David knew back then. He, re, he told them those words 
in Acts 2, 25 through 28. You can read that. That come from King David. Peter said that they were witnesses of Jesus being raised up from the dead and is now at the right hand of God. They saw him uh, uh, sin. See, they can uh, confident and affirm. They can affirm that he rose from the dead. He ascended back to heaven, and now he is at the right hand of God the Father. He is back in his rightful place, and that now that Jesus that you crucified, he said, is now Lord and Christ. I mean, he's the Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. That's what Peter's saying when he says, and Christ. He's the Savior. And so, these men, uh, Luke writes in verses 37 through 39, that these men were cut to their heart, it says. They were cut to the heart. They heard the message. The Holy Spirit is moving. They were able to understand the message. And now they're responding to the message of what Peter said. What do we need to do? I know we need to do something. I can feel it. That's basically what they're saying. I know the Holy Spirit is moving us to do something. I don't know what we need to do next. Uh, guys, Peter, uh, the apostle, what do we need to do? And they said, be, repent and be baptized. And that's what they did. They repented of their sins. They repented of their uh, wrongfulness. They repented of the lawlessness, how they treated Christ. They repented of not having a, the right relationship that they were supposed to have with God. And they were saved and they were baptized. And their sins were forgiven. And God added to the church. They received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that was a promise. He said it was for all your children, your family, for anybody who comes and believes and asks forgiveness, the Holy Spirit will be given to them. And then we hear the greatest, and that's what, that was that, the greatest reminder of, of what they said was in verse 39, for the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off. That includes us, I think. To all who are afar off, as many as believe, the Lord our God will call. See, the Holy Spirit does the calling. We proclaim, but the Holy Spirit is who does the calling and the convicting, right? And then 41 through 47 says, Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now that's, that was, that's a miracle in itself right there. You know what I, what I heard? <laughs> These people got along. <laughs> that's what I heard. <laughs> and you know the Holy Spirit had to be in that. <laughs> Yeah, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. The church was being added to. Who did that? The Holy Spirit was doing that. He gave the disciples boldness to preach and to teach. Who did that? The Holy Spirit was doing that. Everybody was in the Word of God. They saturated themselves with the Word of God and they were fellowshipping 
with each other. They broke bread together. You know, we're not a perfect church by no means. But we do some mighty good stuff through the Holy Spirit. And one of those things that I think we do really well that we started um, a while back is with our small groups. You know, with our small groups, that's how when you take a, a, a big church, and, and I'm not saying we're a big church, but we're a growing church. We are getting big. I, anybody can see that. Uh, we are growing. And it's through God. I know that. But if you want to make that place smaller and get to really know uh, people and get to know us, if you haven't never plugged into one of these small groups, or maybe we need to start another small group, those are op uh, opportunities, excellent opportunities to get plugged into. We take mission trips here, as we heard on Wednesday. Uh, if anybody has ever been called or being called, you get with uh, Pastor Will and them, and they will, I guarantee you it won't be long. You're going to go on a mission trip with him somewhere. He is always on mission. He, is, he loves the Lord and loves to be a, a witness and proclaim the gospel. And he would love for you to join him in those things. We have to be mindful, you know, that the Holy Spirit, uh, God loves to work through his church, and that's what he does. He works through his church. It took the Holy Spirit was bringing them together in those to be in one accord and it's the Holy Spirit that will keep us together and all churches not not just ours but other churches in this uh, in our communities that love the Lord too that are doing great things we need to be praying for each other and we and at sometimes if we can get together we need to get together and do ministry together with other churches I believe in that we're all in this together. We're not alone, alone from any of these. We're part of the one body of Christ, his church, doing his will. Let us, be, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for what you do. We thank you uh, for how you move in our lives. And God, may we... Um, Sometimes we might make things a little complicated, Lord, but as we're going, if we read anything, maybe we can just see that, that these people live their life as they were going. They fellowship with each other. They commune with each other. They prayed with each other. And they proclaimed your gospel to others. They told them about you. Help us to be faithful in that. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for all you do. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. <laughs>